and gentlemen, I've lost a lot of sleep over this decision, but I feel pretty confident it's the right one for our particular situation. So we are back on our 1947 Mercury project, and if you're following along because you have a 46 through 48 Ford, maybe this will be useful to you. I don't really know. It seems like this is the best setup for our particular circumstance. It should be more than strong enough uh, and rated to support this car. We'll get into what kit I'm kind of using, I think, because I bought this all as like a used pile of parts. And we'll get into the whys and wherefores as we go along, because there are a couple of really good reasons that stood out to me why this might be the best setup, as opposed to the transverse rear spring. That was the setup I intended to use, and actually invested quite a bit of time and money buying parts to make that happen. So check out the other videos if you want to see what that's all about. That said, I spent enough time stewing on this. Let's just get in there. So first of all, let's talk about what we're working with. Just spring-wise. We are doing a coil spring rear end, not a coil over rear end, which is slightly different. The coil over has the shock, it runs through the middle, so the coil is over the shock kind of thing. For us, we're just doing a standard coil spring. This appears to be part of a standard Speedway kit. I think it's like 200 bucks for two of these whoopty doos that are your top mount that weld either to your frame or some cross member that you build, a spring that is rated, we'll get into the ratings at some point, and the bottom piece, right y'all, that welds onto a three inch axle tube, which conveniently is what we have. However, stay, stay. It turns out that the axle that we have was a coil over, was a coil spring rear end originally as an A body Chevelle something, something, something. Here's the general plan weld this thing to the frame here, put a spring between here and there, move on with life. In order to get this welded here, we have to, you know, address kind of this thing. So I drug out the old hole be gone and then found these fancy discs on eBay, which is pretty cool. Uh, somebody was selling discs of every size and thickness. I was at work when I ordered these, so I ordered 3 16 which is actually uh, thicker than our frame rail, which is kind of interesting. That said, but as you can see, they fit in our hole pretty well. There it goes. So step one is to weld these discs into our frame anywhere that our upper mount is going to stick to said frame so that we have A, extra structure in there, and B, have a surface to weld to. So that's the general idea. If you started watching this channel while I was building the Model T, you may have seen me employ some questionable welding processes to get that body sort of back into shape. Um, I'm a half decent welder, it turns out. So what we're gonna do here is gonna be a bit more professional. Uh, we're gonna do the right thing and do it the right way and make sure that we have really good welds for all this stuff because it turns out that suspension staying where you meant it to stay is critical to steering and it turns out that steering is critical to not dying when you're driving a car so you know it's still me even though we're going to do kind of you know the right the right way here so step one for a good weld is to clean the surface these are brand new they don't even have any mill scale i think they were water jetted or could have been laser cut i don't know i don't know i didn't care um ebay always use ebay instead of amazon if you can you know like there's a chance i might be buying this stuff from you and that'd be pretty neat not Jeff Bezos. Anyway, we've got to clean this area up here on both sides so that we have some nice clean metal to weld to, and then we'll set up this welder, which we haven't used on the channel yet. It's, uh, anyway, we'll, we'll see. All right, fellas, so if you're ever not sure about how to set up your welder, you're kind of new to it, I don't recommend starting with, you know, chassis work, but, you know, you can, you can learn this stuff. It's really gonna be okay. Don't forget that inside of the Lincoln welders, at least, which are the ones I prefer, 
um, there is always a little chart that will suggest what your setting should be for what your material is. We're gonna work with 3 16 steel and we'll set our you know, machine majigger to do that. Uh, it gets a little more serious when you're welding on chassis stuff. So let's talk about the ranges of, you know, probability of instant death. You know, if you're doing the stuff like I'm doing on the Model T, uh, zero probability of instant death if you're, you know, body work welds, crack, or whatever. You know, you may not win the Grand National Roadster Show or, you know, be invited to cars and coffee again or whatever, depending on how judgy your friends are, but it's not going to hurt you. Uh, this part that we're going to do next is also, you, know, you could kind of do an amateur job and it would still be pretty structural. However, there are a couple of steps in here that have like a level 10 death risk if the weld completely fails. So we'll kind of, you know, I'll try to point those out because you guys can absolutely learn how to do this, but you got to learn how to do this if this is what you want to do. That's, that, that's my warning. All right, the welder's humming away. We've got it set to factory specs based on the metal we're gonna do. It's been a while since I've used this machine actually, so we're gonna go with just the factory settings and then we are gonna move on from there as needed. Uh, I don't use magnets often, but if the right idea in this situation, uh, you can see I've got a reasonable gap because I bought undersized discs just so that we would have that to get full penetration as they say. No dirty jokes. So that bracket fits and we can now weld right here where we couldn't before because there's a great big hole. I've done my research and with this spring rate, the spring rate that's offered in the kit using a handy dandy uh, chart thing that Speedway made about spring rate compression with the weight of the car and the weight of the rear end and they actually had a really nice chart that included 4678 Fords what their weight was. What that told me was with this spring rate, this is a 14 inch spring, and with the weight of the car in its neutral position, it will compress four and a half inches, leaving us somewhere around eight and a half, nine inches. Guess what that is, fellas? Nailed it, eight and a half, nine inches. So one of the things that is baffling me is I scoured the internet and I am an avid researcher and I can't find a single person that has put a kit like this in one of these cars. The Parallel Leaf Kit is extraordinarily popular for these makes and models and it's like a bolt-in kit or whatever. Maybe that's why it's popular. There's nothing wrong with leaf springs. In fact, that's what I thought I was going to do originally until I tried the transverse spring and failed. Um, but it's close to eight, nine hundred bucks. Uh, Chassis Engineering used to make one. Now I think only TCI, total cost involved, makes one. There's nothing wrong with it. It just seems like a colossal pain in the butt and it's very expensive. This, if my floors weren't already, if I where I'm sitting wasn't already removed, this would be a lot more invasive, I think, but maybe not. You know, I'm not really... I don't know if you guys have ever tried to measure and drill holes for a bolt-in kit on an old Ford frame. It's not as easy as it sounds. Either I'm the first person to do this and I'm a genius or I'm a complete moron. We will find out once this is done. Anyway, I'm gonna move on to the other side, trim that floor back, fill those holes, and then we'll be ready to do some like real mathematicals.
So we've got to dive in here. This is kind of a tricky step. We have got to mount our upper spring holder on our guys to our frame. And this requires, well, mathematics and measuring and calculus. Uh, if you buy one of these kits or scour the internet or whatever, no one will give you instructions on how to do this. And I, I'm also not gonna be able to do that, but I can try to talk you through my thinking. I think there are just so many variables in place that, um, you know, if you don't really do them all somewhat correctly, you're gonna screw things up. Here's what I've measured so far. From the center of the stock spring mounting thing on this rear end to the center of the spring mount on this end is 35 and one quarter inches. Okay, there's not gonna be a quiz, I'm just saying 35 and a quarter. From the center of this, pushed directly up against the frame rail to the center of this upper mount, pushed directly against the frame rail, is 35 inches as far as I can tell. There's probably a little squidginess in my measurements, but I think it's gonna be okay. That means we are maybe an eighth of an inch off on either side. Plus, we've got some room to move around on this one. Let's say you didn't purchase a rear end that was a coil spring rear. Well, the kit comes with these handy dandy things and you just, you know, slide them along the axle until they're the right distance. So those would go on like so, and you just slide it till you're happy with it, weld it on and call it a day. So I went back and forth in my brain pan about using the factory mounts on this rear end. And I, I thought of everything. I thought, well, they'd be easy enough to cut off and replace with these other mounts. Um, what if the spring is acting as a lever to push the front of the axle down to twist it? And I was like, well, maybe that's good because every time you accelerate, it'll lift it. The, the pinion will try to lift and this will give it an extra bit of leverage. And then I thought, well, then when you break, it's the opposite. And then I thought, well, wait a minute. Look how much leverage there would be. So I've done a ton of measuring on this thing, and basically I've determined that in this particular case, the center of this is roughly two and a half inches from the center of the axle tube, right? Okay, do we follow? Two and a half inches. That means this thing needs to get welded onto the frame in a place two and a half inches from the center of the axle tube. Well, we've got to figure that out. And my solution for this is to go off the bump stop. In a different set of circumstances, maybe somebody would want to pull tape measure from wheel to wheel and use the wheelbase to figure out how to center it and all of that stuff. In my case, um, all the suspension is loose or missing or whatever, even in the front, it's barely, barely there. So, I'm going to count on the assumption that the bump stop was going to hit the center of the factory axle because that's the only thing that makes sense. And we are going to line up our spring mounts as such and tack them in. Um, that means we are coming two and a half inches from the center of this to the center of, I don't have enough hands, that thing basically something, you know, like that. Leaf blower, neighbors continue to be industrious. In order to figure out a place on the frame, here's what I decided to do. I marked both sides of the bump stop and then where they hit the frame and then measured the center of that, drew a line straight up. It actually coincides with this rivet, which is actually sort of interesting because by eye, it doesn't really look like that. Then, I measured two and three quarter inches directly over and transferred that line. What that means is at two and three quarter inches, our thingamajigger should be centered. So let's measure center on this and then we'll line it up. All right, gang, this is why I think there are zero instructions on how to actually do this. The idea is this needs to be parallel to this. Now, obviously this is rotating and this will change as we move forward and set it. But this 
idea of level is relative to so many things. First of all, the back of the car has to be where you want it. Then the front of the car, which right now is still gonna get a dropped axle and doesn't have a motor, so it's actually sitting up. It's all, it's relative to all of these things, right? So it's level, but it's level at ride height. Um, these frames are kind of complicated. There's sort of these swoopy things. There is no, I mean, you can see on this side, there's no place that this would be. I mean, maybe right here would be level when the car was sitting on its suspension. Um, so yeah, you lower the back a little more, it changes the angle of the frame. You lower the front a little more, it changes the angle of the frame. You change the tire size, it changes things. So what I'm getting at is this is going to be an educated guess based on what we have right now. This is sort of not based on anything, really. Uh, this is why I think none of the kits actually have instructions because what you need is this piece and this piece to be parallel to each other. Um, whether you use the kit piece that you weld on for the bottom mount, it still needs to be level with the top mount. But level is literally relative um, because we're not level to earth we're level to earth when the frame is sitting how it's supposed to and right now the rear of the car is on jack stands roughly at the ride height i think i want the front of the car is sitting on a stock axle with a slight lowering spring it's still going to get a dropped axle and and there's no motor in it so the front end's going to come down which means as the front end comes down, we're actually gonna be changing this angle slightly. And if we have to, if it's way off, we're gonna bust the welds and, you know, do it again, I guess. There's no way to tell exactly what it's gonna be that I am aware of until the car is fully loaded and sitting on the suspension. And then you re, and in theory, at that point, if it's on level ground, you can remeasure everything. So we're just gonna have to do our best because we don't have a frame table, we don't have level ground, and I don't have a way to do the calculations or simulate the weight pushing down on these springs to create our final frame situation. I'm gonna go ahead and, you know, somewhat try my best here to make a good guess. And then whatever I do, I will match to the other side because I think that right now the car is definitely leaning downhill in this direction, but I think it's relatively level front to back this direction. So in theory, when my levelly Magoo is this way, it should be pretty close on both sides. It's the best I can figure out. Basically, I've got this thing at a degree and a half so that when the frame comes down in the front, down in the front, it will level out we did that with a little bit of math and a little bit of eyeball. The next thing, this is also, you know, not NASA stuff. But if we line this up at center, kind of look down, that's pretty much going to eyeball the center of our spring mount here. And I did the same thing, but I can't really squeeze it in there and hold the camera but ran down the center of our bump stop and it looks pretty close to the center of our axle. All we're doing is confirming all of the stuff that we have already tried to confirm is, you know, basically. All right, so we've matched the angles on both sides. This gap appears to be the same, roughly an inch and a quarter. I'm saying roughly because it's just my eyeball against the mark on the ruler, but I think it's pretty darn close. We've lined up our mark on the center of our cup. Spring mount thing. 
to the mark on our frame, which we derived from our distance from the center of the tube. So I guess I'm just talking through to, you know, like a pre-flight checklist before I start welding. We're gonna have to fill in up here, but I should be able to get some tacks in here that are more than strong enough. Now that I've said that, you know, we're talking about levels of death in welding. This has to be welded on really well, because if one of these things comes flying off on a big bump, well, you know, the frame's gonna drop right down onto the axle. We're gonna be in a world of hurt, the tire will blow out, among other things. So this does need to be welded very, very well. I'm not 100% sure if I'll need a cross member across the top or what that would even really do for me because the frame is gonna be kept from twisting by this big honking cross member in the back that already existed for the transverse spring and it is heavy it is butch i don't think the frame is going to go anywhere um, my only concern would be if you know the force here could lift it up but i think that the way that this bracket's constructed so long as we do a good job of tying all of this in right here it's going to have a hard time going anywhere we'll weld this whole front edge this whole side bit everything so yeah, I'm going to check everything over one more time and then we'll, we'll we'll go ahead and weld it. All right, gang. I spent a ton of time ruminating on this and I I even put it down for like 6 hours after I got these two pieces clamped in here. Uh and I just can't really think of a better way to do this outside of somehow trying to pack up this project that I made, you know, immovable and moving it to a flatter surface. I think this is as good as it's gonna get. And um, I think it's gonna be all right. I've never done this particular type of rear end install. It is, even if it wasn't coil springs, it's still kind of hard to locate an axle on a frame like this because there's no, there aren't a lot of places to measure from. So anyway. That's the nerves talking. Let's go ahead. We've got a task ahead of us. I've got to tack this in well enough that it will support the weight of the car while it just rolls kind of dry weight. And we'll finalize those welds once we're certain we are satisfied. Um, but to be certain we are satisfied, the welds have to be good enough to carry the weight of the car. Challenge accepted. Let's go. We're gonna take this brief intermission here. Brief safety message. Uh, number one dog has decided to come out and see the progress on her car. And um, you know, you guys gotta be careful if you're welding around your pooch because they like the pretty blue light. And look at that, already ready to go. <laughs> Doug, are you also covered in poop? Are you covered in poop? I think you're covered in poop. What is all that? Is that all poop? Dog, should we play Is It Poop? Dog, it's on your brain. Best dog. All right, gang, so the dog found something spectacular to roll in. She was really impressed with herself and I was not unimpressed. We had to take a brief hiatus to, you know, wash said dog, which is now complete. The dog is 50% cleaner at least, but I am also 50% more wet. Now that I'm 50% more wet, I am, on the one hand, far less likely to set myself on fire, but potentially far more likely to electrocute myself. So it is with water and arc welding. All right, gang, we have our upper coil mounts tacked. I believe pretty well that welder did some pretty serious work. I've got it in multiple points around to deal with all the forces, right? We're going to have to weld the pants off that and, uh, really finalize it later. But again, you know, I don't know if I've screwed this up yet. Let's pretend that those are in the right place and the tacks are strong enough to hold the coils. We're only about halfway there from trying out this whole contraption. If you put the leaf spring kit in, move on with your life. If you are doing coil springs, coil overs, or a transverse rear spring like I intended, 
This next step is going to be something you will indeed encounter. You have got to locate the rear end. Not like, ooh, look, there it is. I located it like, you know, in the car. Ladies and gentlemen, the torque tube. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but it's my understanding that this thing is called a torque tube not because of the torque of the drive shaft on the inside, but rather it is a solid piece that keeps the torque of the rear wheels from spinning the axle backwards. This, my friends, functions, among other things, as a huge lever. Well, we don't have that anymore, so we got to do something else. That something else in our case is going to be use hairpins, radius rods, whatever you want to call them. Technically, as far as I understand, these are actually radius rods. Rear radius rods if you want to get specific, but it's kind of like the rear version of Ford's wishbones. This will take the place. The other option on a rear end like this and a suspension setup like this is a four bar suspension. And I'm not going to get into that because I don't get it. I'm going to get it, but because I'm, I just, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. So here's the thing. With the rear end and suspension and movement, a guy's got to think about all of the forces involved. Because that's what I'm thinking about right now, because I don't fully know how I'm going to do this, but I got an idea. The basic idea is this attaches somewhere on the front of your frame. This attaches somewhere to your rear axle. So that when you accelerate and your rear axle wants to twist up because of the force of the tires on the ground, well, this stops from doing it. And when you decelerate or go in reverse, the opposite. The pinion wants to rotate this way, and this will keep it from doing so. Now, the suspension allows the up and down attitude, which is what this joint is for, so that as the axle goes up and down, this thing can go up and down, right? So what I understand is I want this thing at the center of the travel so that when it goes up, it goes from here, back to neutral and down here back to neutral. That's one thing I think I kind of know. Next thing's a little more complicated. The next thing is the angle of the dangle boys. And uh, what I mean by that is, sure, simple enough. Car goes up and down, attach guy to said frame. This thing will go up and down. Au contraire, it is not so simple. What we need to do is find an angle in towards the center. Let me demonstrate. Allow my arms to function somewhat, you know, like a, a pivot point for a rear end. If my ladder bars, hairpins, whatever you want to call them, even if you're using old school for radius rods, go straight out on your frame, and these are the wheels, it feels like the wheels should be able to move independently of each other. That's kind of not true. Allow me to grab a level straight edge thing that's, you know, solid to demonstrate. Pow! Magic. So, here's the deal. If my arms are straight out, every time this one side goes up or down, which is how a rear end really works, it goes over bumps, it's not always convenient like this. Now, if you're building a drag car, that's very different. Set your suspension up to go like this and hold the wheels on the ground. If you'd like to turn your car and maybe like swing into a driveway or go over uneven surfaces, your rear end is going to go like this. Now, all of that rotation is in my shoulder, which is represented by the joint here. You will notice that these are fixed points on this end. So your rear end travels in an arc, no matter what you do, right? Let's look. It's like a circle on a pivot point. So no matter what you do, it's kind of a twist. It seems to me like an old Ford style wishbone. If you make a triangle out of it, it's far more forgiving. So we have to find a way to attach our ladder bars in a way that lean toward a center point that somewhat resembles the arc the rear end turns in. I know it doesn't feel like much, but it's a big deal. 
if these were to go out straight, there would be a force at these joints every single time one wheel lifted or dropped at a different distance, speed, whatever, separate from the other side of the car. So what we're gonna do is turn them in and rely on this pivot to be able to follow sort of the tiniest bit of the arc because twisting, this end can't twist. It just can't. It's fixed. That's how it works. Because if it could twist, the rear end could move forward and backwards. And that's also bad news. So uh, we're looking for like some kind of level of happiness. I don't think any of this makes any sense to anybody the way I'm explaining it, but I'm taking a long time to try. It's time to start mocking up these ladder bars. Uh, so let's just cover what I think I know. Number one, they should probably be as far out on the axle as possible. Number two, the closer they are to being parallel to the frame, the more it's going to bind. I think what we want to try to do is basically get as close to mounting it like a wishbone, like a stock wishbone, not a split wishbone, to reduce binding. I mean, a stock wishbone setup is actually pretty smart. It works very well. As soon as you split it, you're, you know, the wider you go, the worse you get. Um, I'll remember that and ignore it on the Model T here in not too long. And number three, even though I want them as wide as possible on the axle, I think I need to tuck them into just inside of the frame rails because as the axle goes up and down, especially on a low car, it'd be a sad day if our ladder bars hit the frame and well, that would stop things from working the way we want. So we're not gonna do that. Monkey run. Oh, right, and uh, scrub line. So I've chosen a set of brackets that drop down below the axle instead of ones that wrap around the axle. Both are available from Speedway, they're both cheap but I need to make sure that that bracket, which it doesn't look like it will, does not extend lower towards the ground from the axle tube than the rim of the tire. What I'm saying is if I blow a tire and get a flat, I do not want the first thing to hit the ground to be the suspension that's kind of locating the rear end. You know what I mean? So before we get started started, um, there's two, I've got two different brackets that I'm working with. These are the ones that I had originally there's the old part number from Speedway. And uh, this is the new one. So this one wrapped around the axle. This one kind of... All right, that's probably a better illustration. So axle tube goes here. That'll attach somewhere at the front. And this other style of bracket puts the axle tube here, which raises everything. I know that might be a little confusing to look at from here, but, um, you know, axle, axle. And there's the old Speedway part number on that. I think this is gonna fit our situation better because the ladder bars will come out that will bring them lower, which should keep them clear of our floorboards and our frame rails. I'm saying that in that tone because I just, I don't know. I'm thinking this is about right where I wanna be for my mounts, for the radius rods, hairpins, ladder bars, you know what I'm saying? Because I wanna be inboard of this frame rail right here so that the up and downification happening doesn't hit this thing. And then I'm gonna come off this X member for the mount on the front of this thing and sneak it as far as I can towards center and just call it a day. At this point, my laziness is working equally for me and against me, meaning I only cut away what I needed to for the transverse rear spring and did not clean this axle up at all, which I'm kind of regretting the not cleaning it up, but I'm lazy and whatever. However, uh, if I had cut everything off and cleaned this up, these would not be here right now and they are working in my favor. Unfortunately, this section is not. So um, I'm gonna continue on the lazy path and do the bare minimum to cut that bracket away for right now and get a point where I can kind of tack weld these sections in. I mean, it's gonna do, you know, I'm not gonna justify it, let's just do it. Well, I did not wanna drag this rear end back out because it took a lot of shuffling to get it in the right place, but everything's in my way. It's really difficult to work in there. Uh, we're gonna, let's just drag it out, clean it up, see if we can make this a thing. I guess we'll see. Maybe we can do this outside the car. Maybe we can't. I don't know. I don't know.
Yeah. That was hard. I really didn't want to do that because it took forever to get that rear end kind of positioned in the right space, but there was no working in that sort of area under the car. So we have worked significantly in what feels like the wrong direction. We've broken a lot more than we fixed today. And uh, the good news and the bad news is it's still early. I mean, I'm bushed and it's like 607% humidity and it's barely noon. Granted, it will be a lot easier to work on now that the rear end is out of the car, but criminy. We gotta put this thing back in too. Woof. All right, so we're gonna leave these. We're gonna 86 what's left of this lower four bar mount. I'm sure, you know, there will be a time where I wish I had that. I would just put a four link suspension. It was close to the stock Chevelle, but you know, we're gonna try these ladder bars next. I am gonna 86 these, unfortunately. That was a lot of work to get those positioned, but you know, the transverse rear spring wasn't really gonna cut the mustard. Um, I think I showed it. If not, I'll try to mock it. I just pulled that rear spring out, but I'll try to mock it up. But basically sitting where I wanted, uh, which is relatively low, not like airbag low or anything, but low, uh, the transverse rear spring was, I mean, basically the cross member was at the center of our rear pumpkin. So the odds of it being as low as I wanted were slim to none, plus all the other issues I had with that, U-bolts, bushing, just things. Um, and this ladder bar thing that we're trying to do, it would be the same if we were doing the transverse rear spring. So um, anyway, I'm gonna 86 these. We'll save them for a future project maybe, I don't know, because well, you know. But this I am gonna leave because I think it will make a pretty decent shock mount and or pan hard bar mount with a little spacer or both uh, because there is a stock pan hard bar under there. So let's just, um, let's get involved and see if I can cut these brackets off and then we'll take a break because it's already, you know, it already feels like that time. <laughs> Where you got to look at yourself and say, Hey, self, is this really how you want to spend your spare time and your spare money? Because it takes a lot of both. Maybe I need to do some self reflection. Guy could spend his time relaxing while saving up for a pool instead, I guess. But no, no, here we are. Here we are. Took a break, had some hot dogs, which I love, so that was a wonderful decision. Seemed like a better decision when I was inside in the air conditioning, but no, we're back out here. Got this thing up on jack stands using the standard lean over and lift with your lower back technique, and I uh, got her kind of level. So she's level this way, and then I have these things level, our spring mounts which gets our pinion angle at around, you know, three degrees. We're not, you know, all of the tools that I have to measure level are pretty accurate, but not like, you know, NASA rocket ship building tools. Um, I'm just using one of these very beat up, old, tired, pitch angle calculator doodles. Apparently I stole it from my buddy Bill. Whoops, sorry Bill. Let's not confuse ourselves and make believe I know what I'm doing here. I hammered this thing on. I'll show you that they don't really fit great, but with a hammer, they uh, they jump right on there and kind of cinch on. 
what I've done here is leveled. So I've got the rear end level and this way level here. So I lined up these holes and made them level because that's what makes sense for that type of thing, right? I got the measurement, you know, from where it kind of landed after beating the snot out of it. It's an inch and a sixteenth off this other mount. It's kind of an arbitrary number in this particular case. Um, I'm going to go with it because it's going to work kind of the way I need it to, meaning it'll tuck these brackets just inside the frame rail so we shouldn't have any interference between our ladder bars and our frame. Right now they're facing what would be forward, directly forward on the car, and I know well enough that that will cause binding issues. These things need to be pulled to a triangular point, something along the lines of that, with the two end pieces as close as possible together. I'm going to make some sacrifices here because this frame has a, you know, a pretty substantial X member. So I'd like to build the mounts for the front of the hairpin or ladder bar to come off of that. If you do your research on it, a lot of people add a cross member I don't want to do that on this car because with the original X member, the drive shaft actually goes through that X member and it's a convertible. So I don't want to mess with that. And what I don't want to do on top of all of that is create another cross piece that has to get bolted in or whatever around the drive shaft or worse that I would have to drop all of this stuff just to fish the drive shaft in because that rear cross member is also pretty low. So when we lower the car, that will also be in the way of getting the drive shaft in. So basically, I'm going to leave the original X member the way it is because it's convertible. I'm going to leave the original cross member the way it is because it's convertible. And I'm going to try not to put one more obstacle in the way to mount the front of our hairpin wishbones. It is going to be a driving car, right? So there's going to be no lack of force on it. But at the same time, we're not building a drag car. We're not like building this car to do, you know, hard launches or anything like that. Um, so we're going to account for geometry the best we can with that in mind. I mean, my guts are to put a pretty good tack weld on it and then use a like hammer or a lever to bend them in until they're at the angle that I want. Cause I think that may be what needs to happen. All right. So this is, I think kind of going to be how it works out. It's really, really kind of hard to show you guys because, well, you kind of have to shove yourself under the car and, you know, considering I've got the back mocked up at ride height, on and on and on, that's a little hard to do right now. So let me kind of try to show you what I got here. The brackets are just pounded on, yonder and yonder, and I've just laid the ladder bars out. And there's a spot, this is roughly everything considered about 40 inches, give or take, from the center of the axle to this mounting point. So I climbed myself under the car and kind of tried to figure out where that would be. I don't think you can see anything on the frame and on this cross member. It turns out that you can see the beginnings of this, this cross member that runs in right here and right here, and it makes a big X. Uh, basically, somewhere in the center of the car like that. There is a spot right about here where the X member has a piece of webbing that attaches to the actual frame frame. So I consider that a pretty strong part of our frame. So rather than make a cross member and do the whole deal, I think I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go with that less than ideal ge geometry for this thing because I think it works for everything else I need to have happen. It's a compromise, but I think it's my best compromise. And then I can weld the front mounts directly to the frame. So now what I've got to figure out is how to angle these things in symmetrically. So we're in a bit of a pickle. Um, I've got everything kind of lined up evenly, like with my brackets on both sides. Now I've got to figure out how to bend them inwards. Um, and the best, the best thing I can come up with is one tack weld right here and using a hammer so that that becomes our pivot, you know, to keep everything straight. I think it'll work, but if it doesn't, I'm going to have a hard time cutting that weld. And then what that should do in theory 
is open up a gap all the way along here, which is fine. This metal is so thick, a gap is actually going, what that'll do is open up a gap right here, which is perfectly acceptable to me because this metal is so thick, having a gap in there will actually help with the welding process. You know, it's just, I guess I should just do it because everything else is lined up. And then once that's done, I think I have to shove it under the car line everything up again and then I think I'll just keep bending the ladder bars in until you know they're at a happy spot and then we'll add some more welds underneath the car um, it's a little intimidating just by the nature of it being a circle I have to do it with just one point of contact so I guess I have to weld that one piece pretty well but I think it's going to be my best bet and then spend plenty of time sort of recentering the axle and like making sure everything's somewhat goodish. Honestly, I don't know what would make this easier. I, I think having the body off the frame would make it a lot easier, but it would be kind of difficult to tell if you're going to have any binding issues with your floor. So, for example, if I had if I had done this without the body on the car, I would have my, used my original mounts. These guys, which would have put the ladder bars up here instead of down here. And those couple of inches mean a lot as far as clearance goes for our floors and our frame bits. All right, gang, I don't know where we left off because we've left off so many times. I have, I, I've been struggling on this rear end, trying to get it located and suspended for two months, I think, worth, worth of spare time. Um, it's slow going and it takes a lot of measuring and uh, a lot of figuring. And we've changed course a few times for, you know, all the reasons that you've seen so far. As of right now, I've got the bracketries lashed on with rope, I kid you not, and the fronts underneath the car are currently mounted uh, with some clamps. So I think it's kind of working out. I've got some bracketries attached to the X member on the frame. Uh, they're relatively small for what we want them to do. They're more than thick enough, but I think I'd like to have more surface area to weld to, so we will add to that and reinforce it somehow. Think plate steel or piece of channel or, you know what I mean, we'll figure that out. All right, so the struggle continues. Here's the plan on the back half. I'm gonna make this distance the same on both sides. I'm gonna make this angle the same on both sides. And I need to make it, this bracket, I want it to be level. Uh, not 100% sure on exactly why that is, but I feel like that's how it ought to be. The issue with that is this thing is laser cut for a three inch axle tube and fits tight. Only, only if you are pointing it straight forward, perpendicular to the axle. And, you know, because the axle is a circular tube, as soon as you rotate that bracket that has the circle, you sort of need an ellipse to fit that. So um, we'll be grinding away at that bracket to make that mo better, but then we've got to find a way to match it on the other side. So anyway, that's the, the process here. Don't want to grind too much out, but we got to grind some out. I know that much. So the axle, this way is kind of level. Spring perch is pretty much level, which gets our pinion up two and a half, three degrees, which is what I think I want to do. And then back here, our little bracketry is now level. And you can't really tell because the bubble wrap, but we are, you know, headed straight over to our other front end bracket thing. That little bracket is a little bit out of line, but 
I haven't made the bracket to hold the bracket yet. So if we want to straighten that out so that we are in the middle of our rotation on our heim joint, we can do that if it's necessary. I don't know if it is, but at this point, I think I can tack this in. We'll get this distance right here and we'll match that on the other side with all of the other parameters. And I think we're closer than we've been, which, you know, Considering the work we've put in, that would be nice. That would be very nice. All right, let's swing on over to the other side and see if we can match that. Let's get a dimension though first before we go to the other side because we're gonna need to know how many numbers on the machine it is. Well, we're tacked in on both sides now. You can kind of eyeball that hairpin radius rod thing Headed that bracket that I've just got clamped on up front there. So let's uh, let's figure that out. So any of you chassis builders out there, cut me a little bit of slack. This is just a little hot rod thing. Now that doesn't mean I get to ignore the rules of geometry and all that. Um, considering I can read, I, I do. I'm aware, you know, of instant center and the idea and generally how that may want to look on a car like this. Um, we're gonna have to squint. We're not really gonna nail that down. So uh, I just need to get these things mounted and then I need to take a look because already eyeballing it, it seems like I screwed something up with my spring mounts. So we're gonna have to get back to that anyway. So first things first, let's uh, dive under and take a look at this. So welcome to Under the Car. There's probably a better way to do this, uh, meaning you know, if the body wasn't sitting on the frame, we'd be able to do this from the top, which would be great. We could measure things, see things, generally do things more better than this. But we're gonna have to make do because the relationship of the frame to the rear end is kind of critical. So if I lift the car up any more than it is now, it's gonna change the angle of the dangle and you know all the things we've been trying to calculate on gang rust removal is always always a filthy process but it's way worse when it's like right in your face and the spiders all right sweet splat sorry little feller i guess i'll take this out just Let's just keep working backwards. Let's just do that. That's better. That makes sense. <laughs> yep. Rust always kind of tastes the same. The good news is we're off equal amounts on both sides. So whatever I did, I did wrong the right way or wrong the right wrong the, I guess we'll be cutting those out which is why they're only tack welded and um, we're gonna try again okay if you keep screwing stuff up, eventually your brain smarts kick in and then Eureka, plumbing supplies. Found some four inch PVC tube that's been sitting in the dirt forever. Ta-da! Much more smarter. So we stick that in there, standing in for our spring. We take our, this guy here, slide it in jostle it around until it feels like it's kind of right we can put our level maker thing on it you know again we're just gonna be close like this frames close to level but it's not like level level we're not on a frame table we're on an uneven gravel parking pad with plywood on top so like let's just get our expectations about there this is much more smarter like here you can see granted I haven't like 
check this all for line uptitude, but whatever I did before was this many wrongs. That's my old mark. That's where it ought to have been. Um, yeah, don't know what I did, but I did it. So that's why we tack things and, you know, sort of redneck genius, you know. Nobody should be letting me build rocket ships or anything for NASA, but this might work for, you know, a jalopy. Problem number 28.2 is how to get these things symmetrical. And the best I can do, and what I'm going to do here, is level it in this axis, level it in this axis, and then make sure that my starting point is the same distance from a measurable point on both sides. So I've got 9 and 3 eighths coming off this bracket to my center point. I've got the same on the opposite side to the center point here. Is it perfect? Nope. But uh, I sound like a broken record with that. All right, I guess I'm gonna tack these in and I'm gonna have a whole bunch of blind mosquitoes because they are swarming. One more tack so it doesn't twist too bad. All right, that looks right. Now, just because it looks right doesn't mean it's right. But if it looks wrong, it's probably wrong. You know what I mean? So we're already better off than we were using the eyeballs and our best measuring capacity at this point. We should have a little forgiveness because it's a spring, but the exciting news about this is this is what, in theory, our ride height will be with our rated spring, right? So if the calculus is correct and the general estimations on the Speedway website thing with the chart, what I used to mathematic this out, our spring should roughly compress about four and a half inches, which will give us this nine and, you know, so between nine and nine and a half inches compressed when the weight of the car is sitting on it. So this is nine and three eighths. Not so bad, right? I reckon we got to move on to the front of our hairpins because they're just kind of dangling in place. And it's, I've not painted myself into a corner like this in a long time. Like, I don't even know if I can fit this helmet under the car where we're headed. I guess we'll find out. I've got to weld these tabs in for the front of these hairpins, or at least get them tacked. I feel as dumb as this looks. I am laying in gravel, getting eaten by mosquitoes. I have a perfectly good concrete floor garage. 30 feet that way. I'm a moron. Finally understand what stupid is as stupid does actually means. I've made this so hard on myself. I mean, not that this stuff's supposed to be like easy, easy, but <laughs> learning, I'm learning some lessons. Time is just marching on. The sun has set and risen yet again, and it is already evening time. And, um, you know, I let this marinate overnight because I really wanted to swap those PVC tubes out for the springs last night. Um, it just, it felt hasty, and I, you know, caught myself before I did it because I was most likely going to hurt myself or break something or hurt myself in the process of breaking something. So with fresher eyes, I'm gonna put my, you know, see if I got any common sense to look for problems. And then maybe, just maybe, we'll get this thing back on some rear wheels, which being honest with you, it's been a long time. Without a doubt, just spent more time looking for 716's hardware you know, in every miscellaneous hardware bucket, pail, drawer, uh, than it would have taken to just go buy the correct hardware, but you know, I didn't. So here we are, and we have everything loosely bolted, which is probably dangerous. All right, so I've got hardware in everything. It's all kind of loose-ish, but hey, that's, uh, it's in there. I think at this point I can replace my PVC with my springs, or at least try to, I'm stalling because 
I'm counting on the tack welds to hold everything in place, which I hope they will. Obviously, we wouldn't be driving it like that, but, you know, we're in a testing phase. Because of all of the different spots we have tack welded, there is absolutely the chance that this thing goes full rud, which is, you know, rapid, unintended disassembly for those of you that are not familiar with that. All right, gang, uh, I asked the pocket computer and it turns out that the, you know, tensile strength of PVC is over 4,000 pounds for this four inch stuff. So I'm gonna go ahead and say that it is likely just as strong or stronger in compression. Probably, maybe, I don't know. So what that means is in theory, if I put a jack under this rear end and lift the back of the car, well, the PVC, if it doesn't explode, will test the strength of those two tack welds right there. And in theory, maybe, possibly, test the tack welds on everything else for this one side. So is it a good idea? Probably not. Am I gonna do it anyway? I think I am. All right, well, it's off the jack stand, which means the PVC and our tack welds are lifting the car, which is Wonderful news because I really was upping the ante here. I've got my welding tank with no cap strapped to the side of the car that I'm lifting with a piece of PVC. So if anybody's giving out, you know, MacArthur Genius Awards, you, you tell them to look me up. All right, so I think I'm gonna pull this jack stand and try to lower this side of the rear end as much as I can. It's gonna show us a lot about uh, travel on these ladder bars here and they bind or twist or whatever. All right, we're on the shock mount or on this. Basically we're hitting the thing on that's factory. Unamas. again but we survived that part bouncing where that's exciting and terrifying I can hardly believe it I'm not gonna go nuts with this but check this out it's moving it's suspended uh this tire over here is kind of flat so the rear end is like the car is leveling itself it's doing all the things uh the ladder bars are allowing it to move um this one's obviously you know you can see the frame moving and the ladder bars not so i think we're it's you know it's doing the thing it's supposed to do which is pretty great there is this remarkable amount of lateral movement which will you know, make me pretty nervous. But the original rear end had a panhard bar and we will be well, working off of that. I've made a mess out here over the last couple of weeks trying and failing on this project. But there's the original panhard bar. Um, it lined up with the spring mount. So we're gonna see if we can kind of tie that into that shock mount over there. And that's what we're gonna use for our shocks. But here is something important to see. Let me see, I'll go, I'm gonna go move some heavy stuff for you just because I think it's important that you see what we got going on here. If you're thinking about doing, Jesus, covered in stuff. 
you're thinking about building a 46784, I think this might apply to something as early as a 3940, but let's not, let's, let's ignore that for now. Let me show you just the rear transverse spring sitting on the ground here, right? It would sit on that cross member right there. What you're looking at right here is a lowering spring. So it's de-arched, it's reversed eyed, and I've removed a few leaves from it because this was, as we all recall, our starting point many, many moons ago. But what I'm trying to show you is that with this thing sitting on the ground, I understand it's unloaded. It's only about two inches from where our rear cross member is sitting right now. And if we recall, our bracketries come off the center of the axle tube, meaning that where that shackle is sitting would be the full foot off the ground to the center of the axle tube and would be lifting this cross member basically the entire height of the arch right now. Yes, it would settle. Yes, the weight of the car would make it a little bit lower than that. But um, right out the gate, I've got the back end of this car lower than would have been possible with the rear spring. And I have some adjustability. I can make it go up if I need to, which I don't think I will. And I can bring it down even further by cutting a coil, ordering new springs. You name it, we can do it. So again, we're not done here. We got a lot of work. We got welding to finish up. We've got a pan hard bar to sort out and we've got shocks to figure out, but we're starting from a pretty good place. I think we're going to get the look we want. And, um, you know, this kit is not easy to do, but I don't think anything is. I mean, maybe leaf springs would be easier. Maybe they would be. I don't know. They cost twice as much and I didn't have any. And this kit, you know, if you have full floors in your car and you're starting with a, an existing running car, this is not probably not the way to go. Because if, if the rear floor or section wasn't missing on this car, this would have been really, you know, invasive, first of all. Uh, and second of all, very difficult to do, like more difficult even than it was. So I'm getting eaten by mosquitoes. So I'm just, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how many of you guys out there are just watching me fail and how many of you guys out there are just trying to learn a thing or two or learn from my mistakes is more what I'm trying to get at, you know. Let's put a fender on it and see how she does. All right, gang. We are in much better shape. I'd like to get it a little bit lower, but that should be easy enough. I think total about two inches, maybe inch and a half. Uh, but that should be simple enough. If we have to cut a coil, we will. But these springs should set a little bit. There should be some more weight in the back of the car. And uh, we'll just, you know, we'll take her step by step. But it is suspended. It does move. This has been a journey. I brought this car here almost two months ago and within the time that it landed on the trail off the trailer here I had this rear end in about a calendar week found it on the internet went and bought it got started we were gonna do a simple transverse leaf spring replacement throw a lowering spring in it put an open drive in it put some hairpins in it move on to the front suspension it did not work out that way we had mismatched shackles we had mismatched eyelets we had I, you name it, I had all sorts of problems. Fortunately, I had this coil spring kit sitting on the shelf. Never, not in a million years, I probably would have forked over the thousand bucks to buy the leaf spring kit that bolts in from TCI or chassis engineering or whoever makes that. But um, I think this is actually a pretty elegant solution for this car and should ride pretty comfortably. And um, But yeah, it took a lot of doing to get there. It's a very difficult thing to measure. I'm not sure the leaf springs would have been much easier. They might have been a little easier, uh, but here we are. Anyway, we've moved forward, which it's, it's kind of, it's funny how exciting it is. It's like Stockholm syndrome. This thing has kicked my ass for so many weeks in a row that I'm actually, you know, I'm pretty jazzed now because we're going to move forward. We're not done with the rear suspension by any means. Everything is just tacked. We still need a pan hard bar. We still need shocks and we still need to confirm that everything is indeed correct but this is sitting on springs for the first time, like the first time since I got it in 2009 or so. And what I mean is 
it came in with this busted rear end that has no drums, no backing plates, no, none of that stuff with its stock spring and it rolled off the trailer after I bought it and I just had to see what it would look like when it was lowered. So I took a Sawzall and cut the shackles, cut the spring mounts and dropped the frame right onto the axle and I thought it looked killer. Well, <laughs> 10 years later, we have the start of suspension again, where it's not sitting frame on the axle, and it's not sitting just on jack stands. There are jack stands in case any of these welds break, but, uh, but yeah. All right, enough rambling. Good luck on your projects out there. Thank you very much for watching Between the Sharks. If you've subscribed, I really appreciate it. It's very encouraging. We will see you next time when we actually start moving forward on this project. It's a pretty cool project, but man, Man, that's been a fight. So uh, I think we finally won a round. We'll see you next time on Between the Sharks.